I want to thank all of you for joining me for this week's Bible study, where our Bible study this week, it will be the last study of this series. Not only will it be the last study of this series, it will also be the last study of this season. So before we even jump into our study this week, I want to first thank all of you for joining me for the Bible studies that we have had this season. And as I have said on several occasions, I hope that you have enjoyed the studies. I hope that you have been able to learn something from the studies, that the studies, that they have increased your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding of the Lord, that they have not only increased your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding of the Lord, but they have increased your wisdom and your knowledge and your understanding of your faith, what your faith ought to be. We have had a few series uh, in this season of studies, which I'm going to share with all of you. Uh, you should see the cards on your screen as well. If you missed any study this season, you can always go back and you can check the vibes. You can check the uh, videos. They are there. And if you want to rewatch a study, if you want to just go back and look at something, again, they are there. You can go and you can watch those studies. Now, as for the study th today, what we are going to be taking a look at is the New Covenant. We're going to pick up right where we left off at in our study last week, where we were taking a look at the New Covenant that the Lord spoke of to Jeremiah in the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. We saw that that covenant, it goes back to David, where the Lord, he said to David that on your throne, it will be an everlasting throne. The seed of you will sit on that throne. So we saw that the new covenant, it is an everlasting covenant. Not only can that covenant be traced back to David, we can trace that covenant back to Abraham, who the Lord, he promised Abraham. He said to Abraham that through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. We can, again, trace the covenant all the way back to the garden, where we looked at in our first study of this series, where God, he gave Adam and Eve instructions. But again, we know that Adam and Eve, they ate from the tree that they were instructed not to eat from. And in the third chapter of Genesis, in the 15th verse, we saw where God, he made not necessarily a covenant, but there was a promise to where the Lord, he promised the serpent, he promised Satan, the devil, he promised, he guaranteed his defeat. And so what we're going to study here in, in our study for today is the new covenant. We're going to dive deeper into the new covenant. We know that the new covenant, we know that the new covenant is Christ. We are going to see that confirmed for us here in our study for this week. Over this series, we have been taking a look at pivotal moments and something that I hope that you picked out from, from those pivotal moments that we took a look at is that they always uh, seem to surround God giving instructions and then God making a promise as well. So I hope that you picked up on on that as well. And so today in, in our study, we're going to take a look at two pivotal moments here in our study. We're going to take a look at something that took place in the upper room. And then after looking at the upper room, we're going to take a look at scripture about what happened at the cross. The new covenant we'll see today was instituted by Jesus. We'll see that the new covenant, it was confirmed by Jesus. And we'll take a look at what it means for us to be living under the new covenant, because all of us today, we live under the new covenant. So let us go ahead and get ready to jump into our scripture. The scripture that we're going to take a look at today will be coming from the 26th chapter of Matthew's gospel. That's where we're going to first begin. And if you want to, you can read from about the 15th verse down through the 30th verse. We're not going to necessarily touch on every single verse there in that passage of scripture. But again, I would highly recommend before you even jump into this study before you listen to me teach this study, pause the video, pause the audio, and read that passage of Scripture in its entirety. That's, again, the 26th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. And again, you can read there from about the 15th verse down through the 30th verse. We are going to start off here in our study for today. We're going to start off there in the 17th. We'll take a look at the 17th, the 18th, and the 19th verse there. Not necessarily going to read that for you, but we will see that Jesus and the disciples, that they were making preparation for the feast of Passover. So let me set up the setting of our study for this week. This study is taking place during the week of Passion, Passion Week, 
the final week of Jesus's life where he had entered into Jerusalem. We just had Palm Sunday. We celebrated Palm Sunday. And we see here that Jesus, he's making preparation for the Feast of Passover. But something that I want to point out is that Jesus, he went to Jerusalem for one purpose and for one reason. Does anyone know what that purpose and that reason was? Jesus, he went to Jerusalem to fulfill the will of God. Now, what is the will of God? You may wonder. If you don't know what the will of God is, well, Jesus, he told us on several occasions what the will of God is. For example, if you take a look at the fifth chapter of Luke's gospel and you take a look at the 31st and the 32nd verse, Jesus said he did not come for those who believe themselves to be righteous. He came to call the sinners to repentance. So the will of God is for the sinner to repent. What does the sinner need to turn away from? That's what repentance is. Well, as we have seen throughout this season of studies, the sinner needs to turn away from taking the path to condemnation. So the sinner needs to turn away from wickedness, right? And the sinner needs to turn to Christ and, and follow him down the path to glory. And so, again, these are thoughts that we have covered this season in our studies. I'm covering it in my sermons right now as well. And so the will of God, we not only know is that, but in the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse, we will remember that Jesus said to Nicodemus that the will of God is for whoever believes in him not to perish, but to have what? Everlasting life, right? So the will of God is for us to turn away from sin, to follow Christ down the path to glory so that we can have everlasting life. This, again, is confirmed for us in the sixth chapter of John's gospel in the 40th verse, where Jesus, he said in that verse to those who were around him, he said to them that the will of the Lord is for those who see and believe in him to be risen at the last day so that they can, again, have everlasting life, not apart from the Lord, but with him in his kingdom. So, Jesus, before we again jump into Scripture today, I want you to understand that he was in Jerusalem that last week. He went to Jerusalem. Even when his disciples were were trying to keep him from going to Jerusalem, Jesus knew that he was going there to fulfill the will of God. Keep that in mind here as we will take a look at our Scripture Let us take a look there at the 20th verse, okay? I want us to take a look at what is said there in the 20th verse. We'll see there that Scripture says, When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. So let us make a note there from the the 20th verse, what we read there in that 20th verse. All 12 of the disciples, they are present. They were present at the start of the Feast of Passover. Now, a lot of us, we we have this idea of the Feast of Passover that we take from the Da Vinci uh, painting, right? But our idea of the Feast of Passover from that painting, it is certainly wrong. So again, I'm trying to, to set the setting of the Feast of Passover here. First off, the disciples, they were poor. Jesus and the disciples, they did not have wealth. So they weren't, they were not in some fancy hall Uh, They weren't sitting at some long, wide, broad table uh, at the Feast of Passover. In fact, the custom of that day was for supper to be set at a table to where where those who were at the table, they would be able to look across from each other. It was like a, a close, joyful, relaxed setting to where those who were at the supper, they would have been reclined, reclined on a couch. Some may have been laying down. Some may have, you know, just been kind of laying over. They, they were relaxed. It was a relaxed setting. It was an, a joyful occasion. It's a celebratory occasion because, again, they were celebrating the Passover, what God had did for the children of Israel when they were in Egypt. Something else that, that I want to also say about the Feast of Passover, just to try to bring some clarity to it, is that our thoughts about the Lord's Supper, all right, it is, The Lord's Supper, it did not begin at the beginning of the feast. It did not begin uh, at the start. So when we read about Jesus taking the bread and then taking the cup, as Paul said uh, in his letter to the Corinthians, Jesus, he took the cup after supper. 
And so what we're taking a look at here from the very beginning is the supper part. And so all 12 of the disciples, and this is something that is very important for us to know and for us to understand. All 12 of the disciples, they were present at the supper, at the start of the supper. Now, something begins to happen here. This this celebratory occasion, it begins to, to change. The mood begins to change. The tone it begins to change. We'll see it there. It says there in the 21st verse, now as they were eating, he said, Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And there in the 22nd verse, we'll see that they were exceedingly sorrowful. The disciples were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? So in this pivotal moment, we see where all of the disciples, as the other gospels will say, all of the disciples, they, they began to ask Jesus, is it I? They were, they were confused because what Jesus says here in this announcement, it almost makes it seem like it was choice time. It was time for the disciples to choose. Would they stick with Jesus or would they betray Jesus? Because again, for the disciples, at least 11 of them, it was a frightening moment. It was a frightening time for Jesus to be in Jerusalem in the first place because they knew that the religious leaders, that they despised Jesus. They knew on several occasions that they de desired to apprehend. They desired to pick up stones and to stone Jesus. They they knew that, and, and that's why they tried to keep Jesus away from Jerusalem. So when Jesus, he makes this announcement to the disciples, many of them, they are confused. Because they are, in their minds, they're like, well, no, I'm not going to betray you. Is it me that is going to betray you? And so it almost becomes like, well, is it choice time? Am I going to remain with Jesus? Am I going to stay here or, or am I going to betray him? And they're thinking in their mind, well, I can't betray him. And the, and the reason why 11 of the disciples were saying I can't betray him was because they had already made a choice to follow Jesus in their heart. For example, over in the 16th chapter of, of Matthew's gospel, when Jesus had asked the disciples, who do the people say that I am? We remember that the disciples would say, they said to Jesus, well, some of the people say that you are Elijah, you are one of those, you know, some other prophet. And then Jesus, he asked the disciples, well, who do you say I am? And we remember that Peter, he spoke up and he said, well, you are the son of the living God. And, and when Jesus, when, when, when Peter said that, I want you to understand that he wasn't saying that just to say that. Jesus, he said to Peter in, in his response, you are of faith and on, and on you, you are going to be my rock and I'm going to build my church on you. And, and the reason why Jesus said that to Peter was because Peter, he had made a confession of faith from his heart. And, and I always, I get into the habit of, of beating on my chest. But this was a confession that came from within him, from his inner man, from his soul. And so Peter, he had already made a choice. And like I said, the other disciples, 10 of the other disciples, they had made the same choice as well to follow Jesus. They, they followed him. They followed him closely. And, and I want you to understand when I'm saying that they followed him, I'm not talking about just following him, uh, being in his presence physically. I'm telling you that they followed him in their soul. They, they, they consumed his every word, and they did their best to live by his word, all but one of them, Judas Iscariot, right? And so take a look there at that 25th verse. Let's take a look at what is said there in that 25th verse there. We will see that Judas Iscariot, he had made his choice, and we will see that Jesus, he was well aware of the choice that he had made there. It says there in that 25th verse, Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He, Jesus, said to him, You have said it. So again, it's quite clear that, that Jesus knew that Iscariot had made his choice. And, and I think that this was a moment that actually caught Judas off guard. Okay, Because he went into the feast of Passover and he was looking for a moment to betray Jesus. And, and when he asked Jesus, is it I, Iscariot, he was trying to do what the other disciples were doing. You know, he decided to join in with, with the other disciples. And so 
when when Jesus said, you said it, it's you, I imagine that it, it caught him off guard because, again, he was just trying to, to play a game. But Iscariot, he had already made his choice, okay? If we take a look there at the 15th and the 16th verse there, we can see what it says there in that scripture. So, yeah, Iscariot, he had... All of the other disciples, I want to be clear about this, all of the other disciples, they showed up to the Feast of Passover, you know, just to enjoy the feast. They were there with Jesus. They were not looking to betray Jesus. And so, again, when Jesus said that one of you will betray me, it caught them off guard. And and it really changed the the mood, the tone of, of the room. Because, like I said, the start of the supper, the feast itself, it was a joyful occasion where there was discussion. There was chatter. I imagine that there was laughing and some joking that was going around. At the Feast of Passover, Peter, I believe, he started the conversation about who's the greatest, who's the greatest among them. At the Feast of Passover, Jesus, he even took a moment uh, to wash the disciples' feet to answer the question of who is the greatest. But again, Iscariot, he showed up looking for an opportunity He was waiting for the right moment, if you will, to betray Jesus. And so scripture over in the 13th chapter of John's gospel in the 30th verse, we'll see there in that scripture that that after Jesus had confirmed that it was Iscariot that would betray him, he got up and he immediately went out. And in this moment, it is. Again, it is so important for us here in in our study today where, again, we are taking a look at the institution. You know, we say the institution of of the community, the the Lord's Supper, but it's the institution of the new covenant that, again, was promised to David and that the Lord spoke of to Jeremiah. And so Judas Iscariot, he gets up and he leaves before the institution of the new covenant. And that's something that that we should not overlook because it speaks to who can take part in the new covenant or who will take part in in the new covenant. And someone like Judas Iscariot getting up and leaving because, again, he had made his choice. It's very clear that they don't have part in the new covenant. Who and what was Judas Iscariot? Yes, he, he betrayed Jesus. He was a sinner. You see, the sinner always betrays the Lord. They are convicted of living in disobedience. God has given instructions, and one who is of faith will do their best. They aren't perfect, and I tell anyone right away, I'm not perfect, but we will do our best to live in obedience to his instructions. We will do our best to live in obedience to his word. And so because we will do our best to live in obedience to his word, we can have part in and we will have part in and we do have part in the new covenant because we do our best to live in obedience. We do our best to be faithful. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at the institution here of the new covenant there. Let's take a look at the 26th, the 27th and the 28th verse there. We'll see there in that 26th verse, the scripture says, And as they were eating, Jesus, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So on the journey to the cross, this moment, it is so crucial so critical for us to where Jesus at the feast of Passover, he was taking the bread and he took the cup and he changed what they represented. He said that the bread was representative of his body, which is broken and and given for us, right? He said that the cup, he said that it is, he said that it is a new covenant made in his shed blood. Think about that for a moment. So again, We said last week that Jesus is the new covenant, and here we have it today for us that that Jesus, he confirms it for us here with the institution of the new covenant, where he said that he gave himself for this covenant. And again, who is it that can take part in this new covenant? 
Not someone who will get up and walk away from the Lord. Those who get up, those who get up and and will walk away from the Lord, they can't have part in this new covenant. They they can't join in into this new covenant. They they will be one day cast away from the Lord just as they walked away from him today or yesterday. So in order for us to have part in the new covenant, we again, we must follow Christ. This this the institution of the new covenant, it reminds me of when I joined church and you've heard me share this story with you before if you've if you've heard me preach before, if you've heard me teach Sunday school before, even in recent Bible studies I have have shared this story. But when I joined the church and when I was baptized, it was not necessarily because I believed. No, don't get me wrong. I believed. I, I was baptized when I was eight years old. I enjoyed going to church. I enjoyed hearing about Jesus. I enjoyed learning about Jesus. I wasn't like like a lot of like a lot of kids uh, growing up in church. I actually enjoyed being in church. But when I was baptized and when I joined the church, it was because I wanted to take part in communion. So on the first Sunday after the, after the, after Reverend Taylor preached, I would wake up in time to see them coming down the aisles, passing out the communion. And, you know, the deacons, they would say, you know, I couldn't take part in it because I had not been baptized. And so I, one day I, I told mom and dad, I'm going to join church. And it was, again, so that I could have communion, so that... At the end of every every ser- uh, service on first Sunday, when they would pass around the the, the plate and the, and the cups, I could get my my cracker out of the plate and I can take my cup, and I could have part in the communion. But something that that I want to say to that is that had I continued down that road, I wouldn't have really had part in the new covenant. The only thing that that would have been said about my faith is that my faith was professed faith and not confessed faith. And you've heard me speak about this time and time again uh, within this within this season of studies. It is not enough for us to simply join the church to have part in the new covenant. You know, some some someone gonna look at me kind of strange with that. It's not enough for you to be baptized to to have part in in the new covenant. There are many, and I want you to hear this clearly. There are many that have been have joined the church and they have been baptized, but they're not going to be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And, and the reason why they won't be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven is because they didn't have faith in their heart. And like I said, Iscariot, he wasn't present for this. And he couldn't be present for this because he cannot have part of the new covenant because he chose... He made his choice. He chose to be a sinner, one who was of the world. He, he chose the world over being with Christ. And think about it. He betrayed Jesus for a few pieces of silver. So many of us today, we betray Jesus over a few pieces of silver. Or I guess you could say over some dead presidents, right? We betray the Lord over the riches of this world when he has far greater riches in his heavenly kingdom. And so, like I said, if you have professed your faith, it's time to make sure that you confess your faith in your heart. You want your faith to be sincere. You want your faith to, in other words, be true. You don't want it to just simply be something that you go out and say, hey, I'm a child of God. You you want it to be more than you saying, I'm a Christian. Okay? Okay. You want faith to to reside in your heart and you want to actually move in faith. You want to, again, follow the word of God. You want to be obedient to his instructions. And again, as I preached about, in order for you to be obedient, that means you must listen and do. You must heed the word of God. If you aren't heeding the word of God, if you aren't moving in the word of God sincerely, then you have not confessed faith in your heart and you cannot have part in the new covenant. You're merely being like Judas Iscariot. You say that you're walking with the Lord and hey, you may go to church every Sunday. You may go to Bible study every Wednesday. You may watch me every Sunday and every Wednesday or whenever you do. 
But if you have not confessed faith in your heart, you don't have part in the new covenant. And that's something that, again, we must take very seriously. Because I imagine if you are watching this, and if you have watched all season, I imagine that you desire to to have part in the new covenant. And so again, if you do desire to have part in the new covenant, if you do desire to be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven, enter into God's kingdom and have everlasting life with him and everlasting life of peace and joy, then again, confess faith in your heart. Okay? All right, so at this point, I want us to now take a look at Scripture that is over in the 19th chapter of John's Gospel. I want us to take a look at Scripture there, the 26th verse down through the 30th verse, and then we will skip over to the 34th verse. So we have seen where the new covenant is instituted. It was instituted by Jesus. And now we are going to see it confirmed because, again, Jesus said at the Feast of Passover, he said that my body is broken, is going to be given for you. He said the new covenant is is in my shed blood for the remission of many, for the remission of of sin, right? So let's take a look at what, what happens here at the cross there in the 19th chapter of John's Gospel. We are told there that when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, that being John, Standing by Jesus, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And there in the 27th 27th verse, he said to the disciple, he said to John, behold your mother. And then there in the 28th verse, after this, the scripture tells us, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. A vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled the sponge with sour wine, we're told. They put it on a hyssop and they put it to his mouth. And then we're told there in the 30th verse that when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And with all of that done, we're told there in the 34th verse that one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. So what we see there, and I'll ask you a question. What we'll see there. I wonder, do you think that it fulfilled the will of God? Do you think Jesus dying on the cross, do you think that it fulfilled the will of God? Now, I want you to understand that Jesus dying on the cross, it fulfilled the will of God. Think about what happened while Jesus was on the cross. Think about all that Jesus did while he was on the cross. First off, the people... And we just had this in a recent Sunday school lesson. The people, they were mocking Jesus. They they were having laughs at his expense. And Jesus, while he was on the cross, he prayed for their forgiveness. Then while he was on the cross, there was a thief. The scripture tells us blasphemed. In fact, both of the thieves, both of the criminals, they blasphemed Jesus. But one of them had a change of heart while the other was still trying to blaspheme. The one that had a change of heart, he looked to Jesus and he said to Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And what was it that Jesus did, right? And Jesus, he, he said, you will be with me in paradise today. That very moment, the will of God was, was being fulfilled right there where one who wasn't baptized, he never went to church, but he gained salvation. The will of God, it was certainly fulfilled. The centurion that was standing there at the cross when he, when he witnessed everything that happened, he said, surely this man was a righteous man. He confessing faith in his heart. Again, I would tell you that at the cross, the will of God, it certainly was fulfilled. At the cross, Jesus, he was becoming our propitiation. That is, he was becoming our atonement offering. All of our sins when we, when we fall into temptation, when we disobey, those moments where in our disobedience we are almost moving in a manner in which we don't believe that God loves us and that we don't love him. And Jesus, he atoned for our wickedness. He atoned for our, our unrighteousness, our transgressions, our trespasses against the Lord. On the cross, Jesus, he fulfilled the will of God. 
on the cross, Jesus, he was confirming the new covenant right there on the cross. And then when Jesus, on that first day of the week, when he rose from the grave, he said, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Again, the will of God, it was fulfilled. It was fulfilled in the death and it was fulfilled in the resurrection of Christ. The new covenant, it was confirmed. The new covenant, it was sealed. It was sealed. Salvation. Salvation, I want you to understand that that it was sealed for us. And so today, you and I, we live under that new covenant. And I would ask all of you a question, since I asked this same question about the, the covenant with Noah, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant that was made with, Noah, uh, with, with Moses, I again will ask you today, do you think that the new covenant, the, the covenant that we now live under, do you think that that new covenant is conditional? Is there anything that 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 we need to do, anything that we can do to be saved, to have salvation? What do you think? Now, to answer that question, again, I want to remind you of the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse. Take a close look at it. I'll leave it there on the screen for you for a little bit. Take a look at what it says there. Right off the bat there, it says, for God loved what? And because he loved the world, he gave who? His only begotten son, right? And again, we just said that his son fulfilled the Lord's will. And so I would tell you today that because God gave the world his only begotten son out of his grace, that is his love for us, that is his unconditional love, I will tell you that we live under a new covenant that is unconditional. Understand today, and some are so prideful that they will that they will say, well, God, he needs me. God needs my love. God needs my praise. God needs my worship. No, that is not the case. What is it that our worship will do for the Lord? What is it that our love will do for the Lord? You know, some are under this impression that that our praise, that our prayers, that our love, that it somehow gives God power, that it powers him up. That's that's fiction. That is absolute fiction. There's nothing true about that. No, God, he is almighty. He is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He, again, has all authority. He is sovereign over all things. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that we can do to help the Lord rule over his creation, to rule over all things. There is nothing. God, he does not need to love us. He wants to love us. And and that, I tell you, that is something that is very serious. That is something that you should understand. There's a drastic difference between God needing to love us and God wanting to love us. Think about it. What have you done that God would need to love you? Right? I don't know about all of you, but again, I'm not perfect. I I give in to temptation at times. I I sin at times. I error at times. Yes. But God, He still loves me. And why? Why why does the Lord love me? Why does the Lord love you? The reason why he loves you is because he wants to love you. And I don't know how that makes you feel, but that makes me feel truly special. And at times it almost makes me feel a bit uncomfortable because I I can't understand the reason why. But again, that is his grace. We live under an unconditional covenant. We live under a a new covenant. Over in the second chapter of Ephesians and the A verse, we'll see there that Paul, he shared his thoughts on the new covenant and how we live under a new covenant that is unconditional, how we live under grace today. Let's take a look at what Paul said there in that A verse. We'll see it say there in that A verse, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So Paul's, his thoughts there makes it it very clear for us, right? 
Paul, he said there again that we are unable to save ourselves. There is nothing that that you and I can do. The, the one thing that we can do is to have faith, right? So that part of it, in order for us to enter into the new covenant, that part of it, you know, that's conditional. You, you, not everyone, again, not everyone will have part in the new covenant, right? Again, we, we've seen that. that. That's been established. In order for us to, to have part in the new covenant, we must have faith, right? But aside from that, there is no other way that, that you and I can become holy and righteous. There are many today, they believe themselves to be righteous, but that's self-righteousness. They are righteous only in their eyes if they don't have faith in the Lord. And so if you are self-righteous, if you don't have faith in the Lord, then yeah, you're, you're not entering into the kingdom of heaven. You, you're not, you don't have part in the new covenant. The Mosaic covenant, it proves that we need assistance, that we need help in order for us to become holy and righteous, in order for us to, to be a kingdom of priests or a holy nation, in order for us to, to be stewards of the Lord, to to be able to inherit the kingdom of heaven. The Mosaic Covenant, it proves that, that we needed help to be able to make it down that path. If you think about it, the pathway to, to holiness and righteousness, that path, it was blocked from us without Christ. Without Christ, it that pathway, it's not even open to us to be able to come holy and righteous. Because, you see, without Christ, we are nothing but sinners who fall short of the glory of God. And so, again, we, we needed assistance. And God, he gave us the assistance to become holy and righteous through Christ, who, again, he became our propitiation. And through his shed blood, he opened the pathway, that narrow path, Jesus said. He opened that path for us to be able to go down the path to becoming holy and righteous. That pathway, it is impossible for one to go down without having faith in Christ. So we live under, again, we live under a, a, a covenant that is unconditional. Outside of, of having faith, there is nothing else that, that we need to do in order for us to become holy and righteous. You know, we, we live under grace today. We live under grace, and, and that's something that, again, we, we have to come to understand what that means as well. So I do want to take a moment to look at what it means to live under grace here. But I also do want to point out about the entering into the new covenant and having faith in the new covenant. Jesus, I often reference the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse, but I have started recently uh, referencing that 18th verse as well, because I think that that many of us, we need to see what Jesus said uh, if you choose to do what Judas Iscariot did, if you choose to turn away uh, from the new covenant. In the third chapter of John's gospel in the 18th verse, Jesus said that those who, who don't live in obedience to the word of God, those that don't believe, they are condemned already. And so again, they can't have part of the new covenant. Now, does that mean that it is possible? Because this question, it often comes up about salvation. Is it possible for us to become condemned when we have confessed faith in our heart? In other words, is it possible for us to lose salvation? Well, again, salvation, that is sealed for us. Okay, so I don't want anyone to, to get hung up on that. We, we've spoken about that a lot this season as well. Salvation that is sealed to us. Again, we saw that in the institution of the new covenant where our sins, again, we have the ability to now approach the throne of grace because we live under grace. And that's something that the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews, that's something that, that they wrote about over in the fourth chapter of Hebrews and the 16th verse. Let's take a look at that scripture there before we talk even more about living under grace. I want, to, I want to show you what the writer said there in the fourth chapter of Hebrews and the 16th verse. We're told there in that 16th verse, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace 
that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so this is the beauty. This is the beauty of, of living under this new covenant because we live under a new covenant that is a covenant of grace. And so because we live under this new covenant, this covenant of grace, you and I, when we err, when we give in to temptation, when we aren't able to, to, to defeat those demons that, that get us to fall over into sin, you and I, because of our faith, because we believe we have confessed faith in our heart, we have the ability to approach the throne, not of judgment, the throne of grace. Whereas John said in his first epistle, in the first epistle of John, the first chapter and the ninth verse, John said that we can go before that throne of grace and, and we can confess all of our wrongdoings to the Lord. And John said that the Lord, he is both faithful and just to, to cleanse us of not some unrighteousness, but all unrighteousness. And so this is the beauty of, of living under grace, because as we live under grace, we can, yes, we can fall over into our error. We can sin. And that's not something that we should do proudly, right? We, we should and heed the rebuke of God. We should do our best not to give in to temptation. We should do our best not to sin. But when we do error, when we do mess up, right, when we, when we fall into sin, God, he will lift us up from sin. Again, Jesus said in the 11th chapter of Matthew's gospel in the 28th verse, when we are weighed down by, by our burdens, by our guilt, by our shame on this journey, Jesus said all we have to do is come and, and cast our cares, cast our burdens onto him. When we are heavy laden, just cast them onto him. And, and the Lord looks to take those burdens off of our shoulders. The Lord looks to take away our sin. And this is the beauty of, of living under grace. Now, I know many people, they try to, to continue to abide by the Mosaic law, but there is no grace under the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law, it will point out time and time and time again that you have sinned. But there is no recovery, whereas because Jesus gave his life for us, because Jesus became our propitiation, because we now live under the covenant of grace, there is mercy, there is forgiveness. And with that, there's peace of heart. And that is, again, that is the absolute beauty of living under grace. All of this because Again, God, he made promise after promise. And we have seen throughout this series of studies that the Lord, he is faithful to what he promised, right? Again, going all the way back to Abraham, all right? God said to Abraham that all the families of the earth, they'll be blessed through you. And to confirm that promise, to fulfill it, he gave the world his only begotten son who said to us, if we believe in him, we won't perish, we will have everlasting life. And so, again, we are left with a choice today. And we have seen this again throughout this series, where we have a pivotal moment to either choose to obey or disobey. And after this series of studies, I would hope that you would want to have part in the new covenant. I would hope that you would want to live under grace today. And so because I have that hope, I will hope that you would choose to live in obedience. Because when we live in obedience, again, we, we find salvation. We are able to attain that salvation. And if we remember what the Lord said to Jeremiah in the 31st chapter of Jeremiah in the 33rd verse, said that the new covenant is engraved it is engraved on our heart. That is, it is engraved in our soul, and it is did that way because all of us who are of sincere faith, we, again, Jesus, he died for us to, to put a seal on it. And then extra is that the, the Lord, he gave us his Holy Spirit to abide with us. And the Holy Spirit writes, writes his name unto us, that new covenant, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. So again, my biggest hope that you take away from this entire series of studies is that 
that you know that the Lord, he is faithful and that you will commit your life to him, that you will trust in him, that you have faith that the Lord, he will wash away all of your sins and that by your faith, again, as I've been preaching recently, you will make it down that pathway of glory and you will be able to inherit the kingdom of the Lord. So again, I want to thank all of you for joining me for this season of studies. I hope that you enjoyed these studies. I hope that you will share these studies with someone somewhere. And again, I hope that you will come back. We'll begin in October. We'll begin in October. We'll take on another season of studies. And I certainly hope that all of you will join me there in October. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you're following here on YouTube so that you don't miss a Bible study, so that you don't miss a sermon, Sunday school lesson, or a food for thought. Take a moment. Follow today.